I have an immense amount of respect for the women who challenge expectations of them, the women who pushed boundaries, creating space for those who came after them. Georgia O'Keeffe is most well known for her paintings of flowers. Many believe them to be an assertion of feminism, though Georgia resented being known for her gender. She was a quiet and at times prickly person, a loner and self-made. I admire her tenacity to overcome challenges, but also to be profound in subtle ways. She persisted despite all obstacles and battled with anxiety and emotional turmoil, as many artists do. But she explained, quote, I've been absolutely terrified every moment of my life, and I've never let it keep me from doing a single thing I wanted to do. Hello? Welcome. This is Flames of the Two Cities. Hello, and welcome back to Tales of Two Cities. I'm Nikki, and we're continuing our March Marathon of Badass Ladies for National Women's History Month. On November 15th, 1887, Georgia O'Keeffe was born in a farmhouse in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Her parents, Frances and Ida O'Keeffe, were dairy farmers. She was named for her maternal grandfather, a Hungarian count, who came to the United States in 1848. She was the second of seven children and attended school in Sun Prairie. It didn't take her long to discover her life's passion. She decided she wanted to become an artist when she was just 10 years old. Her parents were supportive. Georgia and her sister received art instruction from a local watercolorist, Sarah Mann. O'Keefe attended Sacred Heart Academy a boarding school for her first two years of high school in Madison, Wisconsin. But in 1902, the O'Keeffe's moved from Wisconsin to Virginia. The family settled in Peacock Hill in Williamsburg so that her father could start a business making a rusticated cast concrete block. He believed the demand would increase due to the peninsula building trade, but it did not. Georgia had decided to stay in Wisconsin with her aunt and attend Madison Central High School, but joined her family in Virginia in 1903. She finished high school at Chatham Hall in Virginia in 1905. Georgia went on in pursuit of art in 1905 at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. She was ranked at the top of her class and studied with John Vanderpoel. Unfortunately, Georgia contracted typhoid fever and had to take a year off from her studies. She returned to school in 1907, this time at the Art Student League in New York City, where she studied under William Merritt Chase, Kenyon Cox, and F. Louise Mora. While there, she was excelling, and in 1908 won the League's William Merritt Chase Still Life Prize for her oil painting, Dead Rabbit with a Copper Pot. The prize was a scholarship to attend the League's outdoor summer school in Lake George, New York. While in the city, she explored the art scene, visiting galleries such as her future husband's co-owned 291. In 1908, Georgia's education hit a roadblock when she discovered her parents could no longer help finance school. Her father was bankrupt, her mother seriously ill with tuberculosis. But Georgia was resilient. She wasn't interested in creating a career as a painter in the way that she'd been trained, So instead, she took a job in Chicago as a commercial artist and worked there until 1910, when she returned to Virginia to recover from a case of the measles. She moved with her family to Charlottesville and did not paint for four years. She said that the smell of turpentine made her ill. In 1911, she began teaching. She would take a summer course at the University of Virginia in 1912, Here, she would learn about abstraction from Alain Bement, a Columbia University Teachers College faculty member. He taught her about the innovative work of Arthur Wesley Dow, an approach which incorporated principles of Japanese art. Soon, she was experimenting with abstract compositions and veered from realism. She continued to take summer courses for two more years. In the spring of 1914, she studied under Dow at the Teachers College of Columbia University. The course she took at the University of Virginia, based on Dow's principles, were pivotal in Georgia's development as an artist. It was this work that set her on a path to help establish the American modernist movement. 
From 1912 to 1914, she taught in Amarillo, Texas. She taught in South Carolina in 1915 at the Columbia College. It was then that she completed a series of innovative charcoal abstractions based on sensations. She mailed the drawings to a friend and former classmate, Anita Pulitzer, who then took them to Alfred Stieglitz at his 291 gallery in early 1916. He found them to be the, quote, purest, finest, sincerest things that had entered 291 in a long while. And he wanted to show them. In April of 1916, while Georgia was at Teachers College Columbia, Stieglitz exhibited 10 of her drawings. She became the chair of the art department in fall of 1916 at West Texas State Normal College in Canyon, Texas. While there, she began working on a series of watercolors based on scenery and her most private sensations. She freely created designs and continued to experiment until she felt a piece captured her feelings. After showcasing her work in his gallery, Stieglitz formed a close relationship with Georgia. More than 20 years older than her, he supported her by providing her a home and a place for her to paint in New York in 1918. She came to know many American modernists, part of Stieglitz's circle. Stieglitz, despite being married, moved in with Georgia less than a month after she went to New York. She began creating simplified images of natural things. By the 1920s, Georgia was painting flowers, her most well-known muse. In fact, it's her painting of Jimson weed that she made in 1932, which sold in 2014 for a total of 44405000 the most paid for a piece by a female artist. Stieglitz often photographed Georgia. In February 1921, his photographs were included in the Anderson Galleries. Many of these images of Georgia were in the nude, which created a public sensation. Over the course of his career, he made more than 350 portraits of Georgia. In 1924, Stieglitz divorced his wife and married Georgia. Their life together was anything but perfect. Benita Eisler described their relationship as, quote, collusion, a system of deals and trade-offs, tactically agreed to and carried out, for the most part, without the exchange of a word. Meanwhile, her move to a 30th floor apartment began influencing her work. She was painting skyscrapers and skylines. And in 1927, the Brooklyn Museum held a retrospective of her work. By the late 1920s, she was a well-noted American artist. In 1928, her personal life had become too much. Stieglitz had an affair with Dorothy Norman, a fellow photographer. And in the middle of that strife, she had lost a project to create a mural for the Radio City Music Hall. She fell into a deep depression. She needed time away. So in 1929, she traveled to New Mexico with her friend Rebecca Strand and stayed in Taos, the home of Mabel Dodge Lewin. She went on pack trips, exploring the mountains and desert of New Mexico. And from then on, she spent at least part of every year working in New Mexico. She collected rocks and bones and made them into forms in her work. But it didn't cure everything. In 1933, she was hospitalized for two months following a nervous breakdown. She was brokenhearted about Stieglitz's continued affair, and she stopped painting. She left to recuperate in Bermuda. When she returned to New Mexico, she went to Ghost Ranch, north of Abiquiu, and decided immediately to live there. For a time, she was exploring. Recruited by an advertising agency, N.W. Ayer and Son, she was sent to Hawaii to produce paintings for the Hawaiian Pineapple Company, known now as Dole. She took the opportunity to explore Oahu, Maui, Kauai, and the Big Island. In 1946, Stieglitz suffered a blood clot that eventually led to his death. She flew to New York to be with him and buried his ashes at Lake George. She stayed in New York for three years to settle his estate before moving permanently to New Mexico in 1949. By 1972, Georgia had lost much of her eyesight due to macular degeneration. She was left with only peripheral vision, she stopped painting without assistance. She kept working with pencil and charcoal until 1984. She continued to work with the help of John Bruce Hamilton until her death. She worked with Clay and on her autobiography. She moved to Santa Fe in 1984, where she died on March 6, 1986, at the age of 98. Her body was cremated, and her ashes spread at Ghost Ranch, as she wished. 
Georgia was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 1966. She received an honorary degree from Harvard, and in 1977, President Gerald Ford presented her with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Ronald Reagan awarded her the National Medal of Arts in 1985, and in 1993, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. In Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party, she gave Georgia recognition of what many feminist artists saw as groundbreaking sensual and feminist images. Though Georgia refused to join the feminist art movement or cooperate with any women projects, she hated being called a woman artist. She wanted simply, instead, to be an artist. Thanks for listening. We appreciate each of you and love hearing from you. So hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or email us at tales of two cities podcast at gmail.com. That's tales of the number two cities podcast at gmail.com. And please rate, review, and subscribe on the listening platform of your choice. We're on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, and finally Spotify. A big thank you to my friend Ricardo for the music in this episode. We're a bi-weekly podcast, but if you just can't wait for our next episode, head over to our Patreon and pledge for mini episodes and bonus content. Or head over to our shop at tpublic.com. That's T-E-E public.com. And again, thanks for listening. But stay tuned. We have many more episodes in our March Marathon for Badass Women. Until next time.